So I've selected just one verse from which the topic of today's talk has come. This is from the, the tenth verse of the second chapter. This book is divided into ten chapters, just over 200 verses. Tenth verse of the second chapter. It goes something like this. Swagyana darpane sphare samasta vastu jatayaha imasta pratibimbanti sarasiva tatadrumaha Beautiful verse, it means in the vast mirror of your consciousness. Swagyane, jnana in sense of consciousness. Swa means your, the self which is consciousness. So you are the vast mirror which is consciousness. In the vast mirror of consciousness which is your real self. Samastha vastu jataya, the entire panoply of all objects, this entire material objective universe, everything that is out there, known and unknown, and your body, our bodies, and our minds. Remember, in the Vedantic or Sankhyan cosmology, it's not just a material universe. When you say universe, it's a gross, physical, material universe, also a subtle universe. Our thoughts, emotions, the mind and the universe are part of one universe. The universe has these two aspects, a physical, external aspect, and a subtle, internal aspect. And that's also the universe. That's also the universe. So all of this, all this vast universe, external, physical, internal, mental, all of it is, these are reflections in the vast mirror of consciousness, which is yourself. They are reflections in you, the vast mirror of consciousness. One more example he adds, just like the trees on the shore of a great lake, reflected in the lake. Right off. Two examples. One is mirror example, mirror and reflections example. The other one is trees reflected in a lake. Both are reflection examples. One is a mirror, one is a lake. Right off, one thing we need to be clear about and put out, out of our minds is the question, oh, so there is a world and there's a mirror and the world is reflected in the mirror. I have a face and the face is reflected in the mirror. Um, that's okay. There is a world and we experience it in consciousness. That's plain common sense. No, that's not what is meant. You forget the external world. You forget the trees on the shore of the lake. Just take the mirror. See, they didn't have computers and TVs in those days, you know, computer screens. Otherwise, you would have given that kind of an example. All they had was mirrors and lakes. They had mirrors, actually. So mirrors and lakes. So they took just the mirror. Take the mirror and the reflection in the mirror. Forget what is being reflected there. You just put it out of your mind. Not the shore of the trees, no. but the trees which you see you know, inverted in the lake. We have, some of us have had that experience. We went to that retreat in Star Lake in New Jersey. And it's a very big, very calm lake, especially early in the morning. And if you, it's surrounded by forests and low-lying hills. So if you look into the lake in the morning, you will see the trees all inverted in, in the clear water of the lake. You will see the sparkling blue sky. Uh, you might even see a bird flying through it. It's interesting. The action of the bird is clearly there. It's flying. You can see in the reflection in the lake. And the more still the water is, the more clearly you can see the flying of the bird. So all of that you see. I have seen a similar thing in a place called Loon Lake in Canada, in, in British Columbia, a very beautiful lake. Similarly, all the surrounding forests and the sky and the hills are reflected in the lake. Um, why go so far? Right here, in Central Park, um, in the very eloquently, descriptively named lake, which is called, named the lake. <laughs> so, <laughs> there also, when the water is very still, you can see the Bow Bridge and the El Dorado and uh, all of these buildings and all, all the trees reflected perfectly there. Just take that, the lake and what you see in the lake. Forget the surroundings. You might ask, why? Because that's how an example works. Sri Ramakrishna said in Bengali, Upama Deshi. An example is meant to prove a point. 
don't stretch an example beyond what it what it's trying to show because they're using an example to show us something it's not meant to be about lakes or mirrors or the world or uh, trees no, not like that uh, it's meant to be about consciousness and the universe that's what it's supposed to it's trying to make a point about it so when you say as brave as a lion so you mean the person the national geographic assures us lions are not particularly brave but <laughs> it's the lionesses which do all the work actually uh, but anyway as brave as a lion you mean the person is brave you don't mean that a person goes around on all fours and growls and pounces on you and eats you up no, you don't mean that uh, you mean just one thing so an example is meant to prove one thing and the one thing that you need to see here is there is a mirror in which all the objects you put it out here you can see the streets and the building and the people and the trees and the sky you can see everything turn it around you can see your own face there so you can see that and there's a lake in which you can see the world reflected in that the reflection it just looks like that um i remember a similar example many many years ago which was very striking um in india uh, in a train night journey in a train and it was dark outside so when i looked out through the window what did i see i saw the the compartment we were sitting in and the coach we were sitting in and the people and the lights and the but it was just darkness outside there was nothing else outside there was wind rushing by so it's just a reflection there but you see as if there's a world presented there this reminds us of um another beautiful hymn those who have studied vedantic literature dakshinamurti stotra shankaracharya's hymn a hymn to shiva facing south so shiva in the um form of guru who gives us insight into non duality so shiva facing south dakshina murti uh, hymn to that and the first verse is amazing and has this exact same ex- uh, this example it goes vishvam darpan drishya nagari tulyam nijantargatam पश्यन्नात्मनीमायया उद्भूतम यथा निद्रया य साक्षात्ते प्रबोध सवात्मेवाद्वयम तस्म श्रीगुरमूर्त नमद श्रीदक्षिणाूर्त वेरी प्रफाउंड एंड मूविंग हिम it says the universe is like a city seen in a mirror the universe is like a city seen in a mirror what's the mirror here consciousness but then shankaracharya makes that clear nijantargatam within oneself don't think about as a real city outside it's just take the city seen in a mirror and why i found that very evocative was once as a kid with my parents i still have very clear memory we were approaching the city of bhubaneswar where i grew up as a kid and we were coming from the city of katak um and in those days uh, on the highways there were no street lights it's dark and as we approached the city we could see the city reflected in the driving mirror in the mirror of the car uh, i still remember an amazing evocative sight it was just glittering lights in the distance and as we were approaching it and so the city was there and you could see it in the mirror a whole city in a mirror in a little mirror that that took the, wor- the world seen in the mirror of consciousness and then don't think about a real city outside just the city inside shankaracharya makes it clear and then in order to make it even more clear in that verse shankaracharya introduces another example we have the mirror example we have the lake example he introduces another very powerful example used often um a metaphor used often in vedanta the dream example so he says as you see a world in your dreams when you fall asleep you see a world in your dreams just like that a city seen in a mirror the universe seen in consciousness all right now we're going to dive into this what does it mean and what does it mean for us we will use the examples and then we will apply it to uh what it wants to show us what does it want to show us it wants to tell us that we are pure consciousness and this entire universe is an appearance within us 
This is an advanced text, this one, this particular verse. Remember, this is meant to be an answer to Rama. Why should I not give up this world? Get rid of this world. I'm going to go to the mountain, sit and meditate. I don't want to have anything to do with anybody. And I want to become enlightened. Why not? Tell me why not. And this verse is actually building up to an answer. It's an advanced verse. Advanced in what sense? In Advaita Vedanta, there are two steps. First, you realize yourself as pure consciousness. Who am I? Not this body, not this mind, this witness consciousness I am. Swami Vivekananda says, never think of yourselves as the body or the mind. Always know that you are the spirit. This is the secret. Know yourself to be the spirit and then consider the world to be a series of paintings, like paintings on canvas. These are his words. So this is the first step, actually, in Advaita Vedanta. That technically this is called the the discernment of the self from the not self. The discernment of the self from the not self. The separation of what we truly are from what we, we are not. And this goes to the Advaitic analysis of our problem. What's our problem? And this is actually Advaita says you really have no problem as you truly are. Vivekananda would often say to Americans here that if only you knew yourself as you truly are, then we have no problem. But what has happened is, what we think of ourselves is a mixture of what we truly are and what we are not. And this mixture is what we consider ourselves to be. And this is the root of our problems. So Advaita Vedanta says, unless we clear up this mixture, unless we separate this, not physically, in our understanding first, unless we have some clarity about what exactly we are, we are never going to solve the problem. So the first step is this, Discernment between the self and the not-self. How is that accomplished? Consider the unique nature of consciousness, of awareness. I'm using the word consciousness, awareness um, indifferently. Just right now we are conscious. Let us try, when I speak, let us try to notice it. What we're going to talk about is present right here. This is one of the beauties of the Advaitic approach. If I were to give you a lecture on yogic meditation, that lecture wouldn't be yogic meditation. It would be a set of instructions, philosophies and all. Then you would have to try it out actually. You know, sit and close your eyes and breathe and, uh, in a, you know, pranayama and then withdraw your mind and so on. And focus and visualize and so, so on. If I were to give you a lecture on bhakti of Rama or Krishna, that lecture itself wouldn't be, a, wouldn't be bhakti. One would, one would have to cultivate it. However, in contrast, what we are talking about here in Advaita Vedanta, is present always, is present right now. Advaita just invites us to take a look. It's as simple as that. Let's try to take a look. Notice, when you are seeing, when we are seeing right now, we are aware, we are conscious. It's a conscious experience. It's a, I can use many words for it. It's a conscious experience. It's happening in awareness. It's um, you know, a first-person experience. It's a subjective experience. Philosophers call it qualia. You're, you're having this first person experience. When we see, we are aware. What we see keeps changing. You're seeing something else earlier, now it's changed a little bit. Um, when we hear, we are aware. When we smell, taste, touch, all of that, we are aware, aware, aware. Seeing and smelling and tasting and touching and hearing, they are all very different from each other. They use different kinds of physiology, different kinds of inputs. But one thing common to all of them is awareness, and it is the same awareness. Let us take a moment to consider that, yes, I, the same awareness, um, am there when I'm seeing, I'm there when I'm hearing, and hear, smelling, and tasting, and touching. Though hearing, smelling, seeing are very, very different from each other, one common factor is this awareness. Not only all sensory experiences, in the experience of the body, not only the experience of the world, not only the experience of the body, but when we close our eyes and look inside, introspect, how am I feeling? How are you feeling right now? What are you thinking of right now? What are you remembering? What do, we, what do we want right now? When we look into our inner private world, thoughts, memories, impulses, feelings, and, in, and through all of them, we are aware. Whatever we're thinking of, we are aware. We may not be aware, we may not be paying attention to something, but 
awareness, a baseline awareness, background awareness is always there. Consciousness is always there. In thinking, in remembering, in desiring, in hating, in being happy, in being miserable. When neuroscientists said, the IBM supercomputer, Deep Blue, is very smart. It can beat chess grandmasters, but it can't suffer. <laughs> a mouse is not smart in that way, but it can feel pain. So when we feel pain, we are aware. It's because of awareness. In fact, it's because of awareness that we're feeling pain. So pain, pleasure, whatever we... Our entire inner world is illumined by awareness. It's the same awareness which enables us to see, hear, smell, taste, touch. All our waking is pervaded by this awareness. And our dreams too. The whole waking world disappears when we go into a dream world. Awareness is there. And it's the same awareness which experienced, allowed us to have the first person experience of the waking world. The same awareness which continues in the dream world. Memory is different. We have forgotten that we are sleeping. It's a new world. But it's same awareness. And Vedanta insists. This is stunning but is important to appreciate. It insists that in the deep blankness of, you know, complete blankness of deep sleep. No waking, no dreaming, just deep sleep. There is still awareness. The awareness of blankness, absence. I often say the deep sleep is not uh, uh, an uh, absence of awareness. It's an awareness of absence. In deep sleep, it's an awareness of absence, a, a total absence. In deep sleep, in coma, in anesthesia, awareness continues nevertheless, all throughout. Our days, months, years, one day the body will die and pass away, Vedanta claims. There's quite a little bit of uh, simple but subtle argumentation here. Body may pass away, awareness will continue. What kind of argumentation at this point one may ask? One little fact for consideration. Think, when we fall asleep, we lose complete sense of this body. The body is on the bed and sleeping, we lose sense of it. We lose sense of the time and place, that it's night, it's this room, bedroom. No, we forget all that. There's a new time, a new dream place. Um, you have a new body in the dream. Now, if awareness can continue, subjectively speaking, without uh, acknowledging the physical body sleeping on the bed, subjectively speaking, that shows to us we can continue to be aware without any awareness of this body. From an, there's an internal argument, like a phenomenological argument. And there is an external argument also. When a person dies, when a person dies, what dies? You just have to ask a doctor. It's the body which dies. How do you know the person is dead? All the symptoms are symptoms in the body. But when that person was alive, right, like right now, when we look at the person next to us, we are not interacting just with the body. We are interacting with a sentient being. Look at the sleight of hand, the trick that we play on ourselves. When a person is alive, we are interacting with that person alive, the live person, as a sentient being, not just the body. When the body dies, the sentient being is not available to us for interaction, and we say, that one is dead. How do you know? What has happened is the body is dead. This moves on the, um, the crucial assumption that the sentient being, the conscious being, is being generated by the body. So if the body is destroyed, there's no other being left. That's the assumption. But it's an assumption. And the one which is seriously challenged today. Uh, you might think, this is where it starts talking about the hard problem of consciousness. <laughs> no, I won't. Uh, it's just that that is a serious challenge. In modern consciousness studies, if you Google it, that's the hot topic now. The, the irreducibility of, the con of consciousness to the brain. The irreducibility even of mind to the brain. Mind and consciousness not being the same. So we are this one consciousness in our days and weeks and months, in our waking and dreaming and sleeping, this one luminous consciousness. Everything else changes. This is one consciousness which gives us subjectivity. This is the essence of the sense of self. Sense of self is constituted by many things, memories, narrative and whatnot, but those things can change. That essential subjectivity given by, the, by consciousness does not change. And this consciousness is an impersonal consciousness. 
Notice, all personality comes from the body. All personality comes from our memories, our own narratives about ourselves. But consciousness by itself is entirely impersonal. Vedanta says, that is who you are. It is that consciousness. Already we see, you know, the problems of the body-mind are in the body-mind. Consciousness itself doesn't have the problem of aging. Consciousness itself doesn't have the problem of depression or frustration. Those are in the mind and the body. So this is what is already assumed by this verse. Before this verse starts, a clarity about ourselves as consciousness. And this, not only that, this is one impersonal consciousness, uh, Vedanta would claim it is the same consciousness in all of us. It is the same consciousness in all of us. Bodies are different, our minds and personalities are different. As persons we are different. But as the witness consciousness, we are same. Same, not of the same type. In philosophy, there's a difference between type token. So, not of the same type. We are literally the same consciousness. There's only one consciousness. In 13th chapter in Gita, Krishna says there is one consciousness in all bodies and minds. One knower of the field in all fields. And I am that. That's the idea of God in Vedanta. The one consciousness shining through all bodies and minds. We are that one consciousness. Someone would say, so are you saying we are God? Vedanta implies that, yes. Uh, essentially. And this was the non-dual insight of uh, mystics in every religion. Not only Vedanta, in uh, Kashmiri Shaivism, in Christian mysticism. Meister Eckhart says, the ground of my soul and the ground of God are one and the same ground. This We are talking about that ground, that ultimate ground. Yeah. Somebody... Um, from the United Kingdom, sent me a cup. Yes, a cup, and I want to thank her. She sent me a very nice letter along with it. She heard one of these talks and about, am I God? And so the cup says, OMG, I am G. <laughs> and a smiley face there, and a smiley face which says, OMG, I am G. <laughs> Yes, in that sense. Not in the sense of, uh, I am the creator of the universe, I am omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. No, that would be megalomania. Yeah. In the sense of being pure awareness. The essence of what we are and sense of what is God is the same essence. That's the meaning of that thou art, tattva masi. All of this is assumed. That's why I'm saying this is an advanced text. This was a preliminary foundational work. Now the next step. What this verse answers, the vast mirror of consciousness. What is it trying to answer? The question it tries to answer is this. All right, you are consciousness. And it doesn't take too much of thinking to come to that position. Many philosophers have come to that position. The really tricky question is, all right, I am the witness consciousness. I am aware of the world. I am aware of the body. I am aware of the mind. Uh, I am not the mind, not the body, I am not the world, I am the witness consciousness. Shankaracharya would sing, Mano buddhya hankara chittani naham, I am not mind, I am not intellect, I am not memory, I am not even the ego, I am not the body made of five elements. Then what am I? Chidananda rupa, shivoham, shivoham. I am of the nature of bliss, consciousness, I am Shiva, I am Shiva. Fine, fine, we will grant you that. But now the crucial question. What is the relationship between this witness consciousness which you are? Right now, you are. We're not talking about something esoteric. We're not talking about something after death yeah. or after some spiritual experience. It's right now. It's right now. Yeah. It's this very consciousness with which we are living our lives. Yeah. It's this very consciousness with which we love and hate and fight wars and be cruel to each other and be spiritual and philosophical and artistic. All of that. We are doing that with that same consciousness right here, right now. So what is the relationship between this consciousness and everything else you have rejected? You said, I am the witness of the world, I am not the world, I am not this body, I am not the thoughts and the emotions and the memories. They are all witnessed objects, I am the pure subject. They are objects, I am the consciousness therefore, they are off. What is the relationship between you and this universe? So are you separate? Are you one? Uh, are you what? And this is an important question. In some ways, even a materialist scientist would not seriously dispute what we are saying. Now, you would just say it's a, you're giving a subjective perspective. But 
The scientist's major comeback would be, the materialist's major comeback would be, well, look, I really don't want to dispute you on this, that you feel that your consciousness, you're the witness. Good, we will give you that. But what I want to say is, this wonderful consciousness of yours is nothing but a byproduct of material processes going on in the brain. When the brain is dead and gone, you're dead and gone. Kaput, finished. There's nothing left over. So, matter, the objective universe, which you said, I am not that, I am the witness of that, that has generated you. This brain has generated you. This brain nervous system has generated what you call yourself, this wonderful consciousness. Now, this is the materialist perspective. The Vedantic perspective is just the opposite. It wants to say that this entire universe is actually grounded in consciousness. Consciousness is not grounded in the universe. Consciousness is not being produced by the brain. It's not part of the brain. It's not part of the uh, processes of the brain. Uh, it's related. There's some um, correlation, but it's not causation. It's not produced by the brain. And this is where the hard problem of consciousness, the irreducibility of mind to the brain, all of these come in. Now we will bring into play the examples. The mirror, the vast mirror of consciousness, mirror and reflections. You put a mirror here, you will see the entire hall and all the people, everybody reflected in the mirror. The lake and the trees and the sky and birds reflected in the lake. We'll bring it into play here. Notice one thing first. The mirror is the ground, the basis, the support of all these reflections. See, the, if you put a mirror here and if you see the hall and the lights and the chairs and the people, the carpet and the space, everything in the mirror. Now this reflection depends entirely on the mirror. Take the mirror away, reflection will go away. The ground of that reflection is the mirror. In the same way, the ground, the basis, the support of this experienced universe is consciousness. The ground, the basis, the support of this universe is you as consciousness. The lake example. The basis of the reflections in the lake, the trees you see there, the brilliant sky you see there, the hills you see there, reflected in the lake. The basis of all that is the water of the lake. And if you remove the lake, if there's no water, if it dries up, no reflection. The dream universe, the entire basis of all the people in the dream, the places you visited in the dream, whatever was the experience in the dream, the basis is the dreaming mind. If that mind wakes up, no more dream. So this is the first insight this one wants to give us, is that whatever we experience as the world is supported by me, the experiencer, by me, this consciousness, this vast mirror of consciousness. Now, vast. Spara is a beautiful word meaning vast, limitless. What do you mean vast? What do you mean limitless? It's like this. Consider water and waves. So if you see waves in the lake or in the ocean out there, thousands of waves, and in one sense, the waves all seem distinct from each other. You know, you can say, look at that big wave, look at that very distant wave, look at that little wave, look at that wave which is breaking into surf on the shore. So we can talk about different waves. But if you look at water, water is common to all the waves. And follow this. There seems to be a boundary between one wave and the next. But if you consider water, where is the boundary? Because the water is on this side, water in, in the other side, in the middle, water. If you take water, there is no limit between the two waves. No cutting off between the two waves. Why two waves? There is no cutting off in the entire ocean. So from the perspective of water, water is not limited by the waves. Because the waves are nothing but water. Everywhere there is a wave, there is water. Water is not limited by the waves. Use this example for the... Mirror reflections and the lake reflections. The mirror is not limited by the reflections. So what I mean by this is, if I have a mirror here, and you can see the whole hall reflected in the mirror. Now, if I say, um, if I ask you, the mirror, 
you know, we all limit each other. Where you and the other person begins. Where this hall ends, the outside begins. So they are limited from each other. They are separated from each other. But in the mirror, in the mirror, where you see people and you see chairs and you see the inside of the hall, outside the hall, everything in the mirror. From the perspective of the mirror, the glass, the glass is not limited by any of them. Yeah. This person is different from the other person, it's the same glass through them. The glass does not stop when one person begins. In, in real life here, one person stops where the other person begins. Empty space starts where the occupied space ends. But the glass is not limited by anything in the reflection. Is this understandable? Or the water in the lake. The water which constitutes the lake. Look at the trees and the tree line and the sky and the clouds. They're all different from each other. One tree is different from the other. The bird is different from the tree. But the water in the lake in which those reflections are appearing is not limited by the bird or the trees or the cloud. It's all water, seamlessly, without any, any problem. You can reflect a hundred trees in the water. It's not that the water will be squeezed out if you reflect two hundred trees in the water. <laughs> because it is, every bit of it is the water. Similarly, the argument here is, you as consciousness, you are not limited by what is reflected in you. The universe does not limit you. Therefore, the vast mirror of consciousness. That is not our common sense understanding of consciousness. We feel, I am aware, I am the spark of awareness, and here is this world outside me, which definitely limits me, because this is not me, and this is me. This is I. And the, the story about I, I don't know, it's not relevant, but something to cheer people up in the middle of abstract <laughs> metaphysics. The gates of heaven. And I think, who is that? St. Peter. St. Peter says, who's there? And this person says, it is I. And everybody was saying, it's me. It's, it is I. And St. Peter says, oh good, another English teacher. <laughs> the vast mirror of consciousness, vast in the sense it's not limited by anything that appears in consciousness. In life here, we seem to be different from each other. Is it getting a little warm, tad warm in here? Uh, can you switch on the fans for a short while? No? Some of you look seem to be... Yes, yes. That one, that one, that fan there. Yes. Just for a short while. If you start feeling cold, we can switch it off again. Because people look looking a little not so conscious anymore. <laughs> So, this is the first thing to realize, that the mirror is the basis, the support of the reflections. And the mirror is not limited by the reflections. The water is the basis, the support of all the um, trees and everything reflected in the water. Similarly, you, the consciousness, you are the basis, the support of this universe. We are not a tiny little thing separated from the universe, observing you know, like peeping and observing into, into the universe. No, the entire universe is appearing in us. You are the basis of this universe. Let's go a little deeper. Notice another thing about the reflections in the mirror and the reflections in the lake. In the mirror, when you see people and streets and cars and trees, there really aren't people and streets and cars and trees. It's just glass. It's just a mirror. Really, it's a mirror. It looks like people. It looks like, and they look, they do people things, cars do car things, and streets do street things. As one of our swamis, Ashokanandaji, once he was giving a talk. This universe, it's consciousness acting as a table, consciousness acting as a chair. And somebody said, if it's really consciousness, why don't they move a little bit? And, that would be bad acting. <laughs> So it is, it's just glass. And if you look in the mirror, in, in the lake, if you see trees and um, clouds and birds you know, flying around in the reflection in the lake, if you touch them, you won't touch a tree or a cloud or a bird. You'll just touch water. Your hands will get wet. Now, what I mean by this is, 
in the mirror, there is only the mirror, though a whole city may appear in it. In the lake, there is only water, though a forest and a hill and a bird may appear in it. In consciousness, there is only consciousness, though a universe may appear in it. In you, there is only you, though an other may appear in it. This is the great doctrine of Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Brahman is real, consciousness is real, the world is an appearance. In the words of Sri Ramakrishna, somebody asked Sri Ramakrishna, um, in one sentence, teach me in one sentence so that I may attain to spirituality. And Sri Ramakrishna said immediately, Brahman is real, the world is an appearance, realize this. Swami Brahmananda writes, having said this, Sri Ramakrishna fell silent, as if to emphasize there's nothing more to be said. So this is the new insight we get from the mirror example and the lake in example. What do we get? In the mirror, there's only the mirror. There aren't people in a mirror. Reflections, yes. But there aren't people in a the mirror. There aren't cars and streets. There isn't a city, there isn't Manhattan or the city of Bhuvaneshwar in the mirror. No, no, no. There's only the mirror. There's an appearance of a city. Consciousness is real, the world is an appearance in consciousness. You are real, the world is an appearance in you. In the words of the idealist British philosopher Bradley, who said, um, reality never appears and what appears is not real. <laughs> it's a play on the word appearance, you know? Appearance is two things. What appears to you is appearance and what pretends is appearance. So reality never appears, but what appears is not real. Now at this point, somebody might object. Some people don't like the word false. And Vivekananda said, you don't have to use the word false. Why say false? We are going not from falsity to truth, but from lower truth to higher truth. It's the same thing. Advaita Vedanta also says two tiers of truth. Relative, empirical, transactional truth, this word. And here everything works. Um, your credit card will work, the subway works, thankfully, and the city will work and clear the snow, thankfully. All of that works. Uh, so you call it transactional truth, relative truth, empirical truth, but what Advaita says is there is a higher truth. And that's true of the mirror example also. In the mirror example also, you will see cars driving around, people talking and all of that, although there are no people, no cars, nothing. So the higher truth is that it's a mirror. And the transactional truth is things are happening. Why this uh, lower truth to higher truth language is important, language is important, is um, because if you just say false, mithya, false, you're calling into question all human pursuits. You get, although Advaita Vedanta does not mean it that way, but still you get a feeling of saying, so Advaita says science is false and art is false and religion, even Advaita Vedanta is false. So all of that is falsity, we are Im immersed in falsity. Advaita Vedanta says, no, we can change the language. We can be more politically correct and say it's lower truth. And there's a higher truth. What does that mean? It means, lower truth means false actually. But anyway, <laughs> just, to, just to keep you happy, we'll say it's lower truth. But it's important in the sense, Advaita has no problem with science or, or you know, politics or uh, um, conventional religion or morality. No, all of those things are important. At their level of truth, they work. And it's important. Nagarjuna, um, nearly 2,000 years ago, one of the greatest Indian philosophers, he says in his Mula Madhyamaka Karika, uh, the Buddha taught two truths, the ultimate truth and the relative truth. Dve Satya, he says, Satyam Paramarthikam, Satyam Cha Samrittim Cha. The Paramarthika absolute truth and the relative truth. And then he goes on to say, um, Samvritti manashritya paramartham nadhigamyate. No one attains to the ultimate truth without taking the help of relative truth. So, ultimate truth, yes, it's there, pure consciousness, and it's you. But you need a little bit of help in the relative truth, which is like coming to the Vedanta society on a cold morning and listening to a Vedanta talk. All of it is relative truth, and within brackets, false. But, <laughs> but it, we need this scaffolding to show us what we truly are. So, this is the deeper insight. What was the first insight? Consciousness, mirror, lake is the basis. 
of the reflection. Consciousness is the basis of the universe, ground of the universe. Second, it is the ground which is real. What is supported by the ground is not real. It's not like this table supporting a book. The book is also real, the table is also real. Not like that. It's more like a mirror and a reflection, lake and a reflection, dream and its contents. Like that. So, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. The Brahman consciousness is real, the world is false. world is an appearance in consciousness. What about me? Am I real or false? Well, we told you, you are consciousness, you are real. You are the reality itself. Further, go deeper. Take at this point, take a look at the implications of what we have just been saying. This is where you can cash it in and enjoy the benefits of it. This implies freedom. Falsity cannot impact reality. Shankaracharya says, all the water in a mirage is not enough to wet one grain of sand in the desert. Whatever this world can offer, whatever it can tempt you with and whatever it can terrify you with, it cannot add or take away one bit from you. Ashtavakra sings, In me the infinite ocean of consciousness, the waves of this universe arise. Let them arise, let them subside. I neither increase nor am I diminished thereby. May ananta maham bodo vishva vichi swabhavata udetu vastamayatu name vriddhi navakshati. In me, the limitless ocean of consciousness, let birth come, let death come. I am not increased, not diminished by that. Let success come or failure come. I am not increased or diminished thereby. Let joy come or misery come. I am not increased or diminished thereby. In the ultimate sense, Transactionally, all those things will go on, ups and downs. In the ultimate sense, I am not diminished or increased by nothing this world will do can add one bit to you. Even Vedanta, what can it add to you with all this? Nothing. It can only show you what you already are. It didn't do one bit to you. The ultimate truth is you, your real, real nature. It's you already. So, you realize that. Vedanta shows you this. What's the, what's the effect? What are the consequences? In that case, nothing that happens in this world, nothing that happens in the reflection can affect the mirror. There may be, um, take the mirror there in the lake, the lake is frozen there. Mirror doesn't become cold. If there is a fiery explosion, the mirror doesn't burn up. The reflection, if you can see the reflection in the mirror, mirror doesn't burn up. Whatever is reflected, the reflection cannot affect the mirror. The world does not affect the vast mirror of consciousness. You, this is freedom, this is mukti, moksha, nirvana. While experiencing the world, the world with its display of the world is there. Um, summer has gone and now winter has come. You, the consciousness in which this is appearing, is exactly the same. You are ne neither very hot in summer nor very cold in winter. <laughs> consciousness is free. Childhood, middle age, old age, body. I see the tree reflected in full bloom in the, in, the, in the water. When you see the water, the glorious display of the tree, when you see there, if you go to pluck one flower, you will not get anything, water only. And the same tree in winter is a mass of sticks. All leaves have fallen. If you go to touch that and you feel bad for that reflection, no, it's the same water. Youth has gone away, old age will come. There will be wrinkles and the body will slow down. Why? Even the mind may slow down as the brain slows down. You are absolutely fine. And not as a matter of rhetoric, not as a matter of positive thinking. As a fact, you have to see, this is also appearing in the vast lake of consciousness. Which everybody is. We have that same one vast lake of consciousness. You are free of the travails of the body. You are free of the travails of the mind. The mind may kick up a storm. Unhappiness, depression, restlessness, in the midst of the stormiest thing going on, you know, so you can reflect it in the mirror. The mirror is not stormy. The mirror is perfectly all right. The dream example which Shankaracharya speaks about in the Dakshinamurti Stotra. What happens when we snap out of a nightmare and we say, oh, thank God it was a dream. Nothing bad has happened. The waker is not affected by what happens in the dream. You, that vast mirror of consciousness, which we are, is not affected. 
Mm. One day this might sound a little morbid. One day the body will go for all of us, sooner or later. That day, I'm being sort of tongue in cheek, look back and say, hey, that Swami guy was right. I'm still there. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> yeah. This is freedom. Freedom not by running away from this world and then sitting safely in a quiet um, Himalayan mountain, which I did. <laughs> not in that sense. Uh, but freedom right here in the midst of everything. Because this is a reflection in the mirror that you are, the mirror of consciousness. This is a reflection in the vast lake which you are. This is a dream in the dreamer that you are. It does not affect you in the deep sense. It will affect the body. It will even sometimes affect the mind. But if you strongly assert this knowledge in the mind, the mind at least will be safe from the travails of this. And to some extent the body also will benefit from the peace in the mind. I have seen this demonstrated again and again. It's not mere theory. It's direct experience. And I've seen monks, not just monks, devotees who have practiced this. And they don't have to practice it in this way. They somehow have practiced it in a devotional way. A complete surrender to God. What is God? It's this vast mirror of consciousness as if seen from the outside. Vivekananda says, this, your real nature, as if seen from the outside is what religions call God. But if you have that, the guts and the chutzpah to go ahead and say, OMG, I am G. <laughs> then then it, this is directly available to all of us. And we see at least at that, from that perspective, it is all right. From, the, from a very deep perspective, existentially we have no problems. This is called mukti. This is called freedom. In the most restless mind, the most peaceful mind, same vast mirror of consciousness. The most depressed mind, the pain of depression and unhappiness, the most relaxed and cheerful mind, same vast mirror of consciousness. If I were not the same vast mirror of consciousness, even the experience of depression would not have been possible. If I were not the same vast mirror of consciousness, even the cheerful, happy-go-lucky life wouldn't have been possible. I am that. Aham Brahmasmi, I am consciousness. One more point and then I'll be done. We have to go even further. So these are the benefits which you enjoy, take a look at the benefits. Take a look at yourself as the vast mirror of consciousness and notice everything that we experience in life is an appearance in this vast mirror of consciousness. And then look at the benefits. From the perspective of yourself as the vast mirror of consciousness, what problem do you have? Pain, pain is in the body. Unhappiness in the mind. One monk told, her, told me a very wise thing. How do you apply Vedanta? He said, don't misplace things, O monk. Put things where they belong. In Hindi he said, Jo jahan ka cheez hai, usko rehne do Mahatma ji. If there is pain, don't take it upon yourself. Don't say, oh, I am in so much pain. I am not in pain. I am the vast mirror of consciousness in which pain is being experienced. <laughs> it's an appearance. Which is literally true. Literally true. That's the actual accurate description. Is there pain by itself? Is there even I by myself and my pain by myself? No, it's all in consciousness. And that consciousness was never in pain. Pain. How can consciousness have pain? Consciousness can illumine the pain in the body. Desire and frustration. In the vast mirror of consciousness, this wave of desire arose and it was not fulfilled. It was, there, there is a consequence reaction of frustration or anger or unhappiness. I am the same tranquil mirror of consciousness. Think about it this way. Forget the world for a moment. Drive away all worldly thoughts, all concern about the world, the people, about ourselves, about our own lives. Drive away all memories, forget what was there even one minute ago, the entire life, forget, complete amnesia. Then shut the senses. I'm not seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, anything. Absolute stillness. I'm still aware. And that awareness by itself, what does it need? Nothing. Without asking the mind, without asking memories, without asking the world, what does consciousness need? Nothing. What is consciousness afraid of? Without looking at the world, the mind, memory, senses, what is consciousness by itself afraid of? Nothing. 
What does it desire? Nothing. What are you waiting for as consciousness? Nothing. What problem do you have as consciousness? Nothing. Are you bored? No. No. <laughs> Interesting. So, and this is just a thought experiment. But when you actually look and stay with it, you will begin to see it's a fact, not a thought experiment. Beyond all thought. Illumining all thoughts is that one consciousness. All right. One more last point, but it's a very important point. I'll say that and wrap up. Shankaracharya makes it in his Dakshinamurti Stotram. Yasakshat kurute prabodha samaye swatmanam evadvayam. Who, you remember the man who was sleeping and dreaming. Now at the time of waking up, this one realizes the self as non-dual. We are coming to non-duality now. The self as non-dual. What does it mean? Imagine what happens when we wake up. When we wake up from a dream, we realize, oh, first of all, it was a dream. This is real. We sit up on the bed and think that. And then whatever we saw in the dream, whoever we saw in the dream, do they constitute an other to me, the dreamer? Are they countably? Suppose I saw a hundred people in the dream. When I wake up, what do I say? Were there a hundred people? I and a hundred others? A hundred and one? He said, no. In all my dreams, there was only one. What about all the other people? What about all the other things you saw, places you visited? They were not countable others apart from myself. I eat a cookie and I like it. In my dream, I eat three more. Do I wake up and say, oh, I've got to watch my sugar. I ate four cookies. We don't say that. We don't count the three dream cookies. So what we saw in the dream is not counted. Everything in the dream is not, is not a countable second. There's only one without a second, the dreamer, you the dreamer. So the dream, the contents of the dream are non-dual with respect to you. They are not a second. You see in what sense they are non-dual? They are you. Everything and everybody in the dream was you in fact. You means you the dreamer, the one who woke up. Similarly, everything reflected in the mirror are there really countably many, many people, cars, streets, um, birds, um, uh, trees in the reflection in the mirror? Not at all. There's only a mirror. Only one thing, the mirror. So the mirror is non-dual. The, the city seen in the mirror is non-dual with respect to the mirror. There's no second thing there. Advaitam. Similarly in the lake, there aren't hundred trees and a mountain and birds. No, there's only one water and that water is non-dual with respect to the what was reflected in it. Because you can't deny it was a reflection. You saw something there. That's what you saw is not a second. It is that one thing appearing as an other. Similarly, in consciousness, in the vast mirror of consciousness, the entire universe appears, but as non-dual, not really as a second. There is nobody here who is not you. Nobody. Every stranger, everybody who ever lived or will live, who lives living now, every human being, every plant, animal, every sentient being, every non-sentient being. And remember the very simple incident of the Holy Mother, Sharada Devi, in her simple village abode in Jairambati, in the, the small village in Bengal. And this lady was sweeping the village courtyard. And having swept it, she tossed the broomstick away. And the mother rushed in and said, What is this, my dear? Uh, don't do that. Even that broomstick has its own dignity and its place. And she carefully lifted it and put it in its place. The last thing, very last thing she said before her passing, she said to the women who were attending to her in her last hours, she said, The world is your own. There is no one here who is an other. Learn to make the world your own. Do not look upon the faults of others. If you must, look upon your own faults. If you must look, find fault, look upon your own faults. Because no one is an other. Make the world your own. Advaitam, non-dual. They are not a second apart from you. The mirror, the reflections are not a second apart from the mirror. They are the mirror. Though they appear to be houses and people and things like that. 
Similarly, this world, other people, they seem to be other, but they are that same one vast mirror of consciousness, appearing as this person, and that person, and so on. Let me repeat that uh, beautiful verse. Um, the, in the vast mirror of consciousness, the entire range of objects in this universe appears as reflections, just like trees reflected, you know, the trees on the shore reflected in a great lake. Swagyana darpane sphare samasta vastu jataya imasta pratibimbanti sarasiva tatadrume. I'm reminded of a line from a poem by Aurobindo, who wrote about his enlightenment, the, the eternal self, in a little poem. He says, What was it like? He says, it's the world drowned in an immortal gaze. That's a good way of putting it. Right now we are so absorbed in gazing upon the world, we are, we are absorbed in what we are seeing. You turn inwards into the seer. As the seer becomes, becomes pronounced, becomes clear, you begin to notice, instead of seeing what is reflected in the mirror, become aware of the mirror, even while the reflection is there. Become aware of the mirror. You will see the mirror will become predominant. And if you see what's there, you won't say it's a city. You will say it's a mirror. As the seer becomes prominent, seer becomes dominant, the world drowned in an immortal gaze. What is that immortal gaze? You are that immortal gaze. You are that limitless consciousness. So Vashishta's reply to Rama was, this very world you are seeing, it's not something that you can toss aside or you should toss aside or you need to toss aside. You are the very support of this world. First. Second, you are real, the world is an appearance. What is an appearance cannot affect you, Rama. Even while the kingdom and everything is appearing, it is you are free of it. That's the implication. Why would you want to run away from this? Should not, because you are making a fundamental mistake, a, a philosophical mistake. And finally, you are non-dual consciousness. There is literally, when you say, I am Brahman, you are literally saying, there is nothing apart from me. So what is it that you are trying to give up? In the midst of the world, you are limitless consciousness. When the world disappears, as it will, every night it disappears, you are limitless consciousness. Not one bit better or worse. You are absolutely fine. The world disappears. In deep samadhi, in the waking state itself, if you practice deep meditation, you, one can abstract oneself by the force of practice, a pure, still mind, can abstract oneself, even while awake, from the world. The world will disappear. You will still be that one vast mirror of consciousness. That's what Advaita is pointing towards. I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, Masharada, Swami Vivekananda, to shower their blessings on us so that we may come to see sometime in this life as soon as possible at least before bodily death this vast mirror of consciousness and realize that it is it is one non-dual the ground of this universe ever free of suffering and then our lives will be a blessing to ourselves and blessing to others Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu